So today we will move to the uh, unit number two of your uh, electron circuit course. And in unit one, we have discussed about uh, the different types of diode circuits. More specifically, the diodes uh, used uh, rectifier circuit. In, uh, in rectifier also, we have different types like a half wave rectifier, a full wave rectifier using center transformer, and then using bridge rectifier. Now we discussed about the filter circuit, right? Regulator circuit using generator diodes. And last day we have uh, discussed uh, the different types of clipping and clamping circuit. Okay. So your journey with that was good because, in fact, uh, that was a very uh, simple device to start with. Uh, you have only two terminals, anode and cathode, and only one current, right? Only one current which flows from Typically from anode to cathode. If I just forget about uh, the uh, breakdown current for generate diode, uh, apart from that, the typically the diode current flows from uh, anode to cathode. And only one voltage line, right? It's a two terminal device. That's why it is known as a diode, di electrode. Di means two. Di means two and di electrode. And from this, uh, this diode, that particular name came. Okay. Now, uh, today we discuss something. Uh, as you can see from the name itself, uh, it's a uh, I don't know whether, you, hopefully you are already familiar with this particular device in your uh, first semester course, uh, basic electronics. Uh, but today, uh, hopefully you know that uh, this is a kind of device which is having uh, more than two terminals. As of now, uh, most of the cases you are familiar with the devices or instruments which are having two terminals. Let it be electronic devices or any measuring equipment. For example, you have the diodes. Before that, you have stu uh, studied the transistor, I mean your uh, resistance and uh, your inductor, the uh, capacitor, the voltage source, current source, all, all of these stuff like the resistance, conductance, and your uh, voltage source, current source. So, all of them are having two terminals. And as far as the measuring instrument, like uh, your, uh, say, say, voltmeter, for example, or ammeter, for example, so they do have these uh, two terminals only, right? Now, typically, uh, uh, so okay, apart from these devices, you, you do have some other devices. Not only this BJT is the only one, apart from that, there are so many devices which is having terminals. But this is the first device uh, after a diode or, or resistor or inductor or capacitor, which uh, you are supposed to study, which is having more than two terminals. Right. Now, you have uh, this particular device is having three terminals, as you know. Three terminals. And uh, obviously, if you have three terminals, you have more than two voltage, more than more than one voltage, right? More than one voltage and more than one current. Unlike the in case of diode, you have only uh, one current and only two voltage. Between the anode to cathode, you have applied only one voltage. Either this voltage is positive or this voltage is positive. And accordingly, you have uh, like uh, only one voltage, one current. But here you have so many combinations. If I have three kind of thing, I mean, uh, say terminal one, terminal two, terminal three, so you can apply. Voltage between 1 and 2, you can apply voltage between 2 and 3. And if you know this 1 and 2 and 2 and 3, then you can easily calculate 1 and 3. That voltage, right? Eventually, there are two independent voltages between 1 and 2 and terminal 2 and 3, right? And obviously, if you have three terminals, then you should have three currents. So, it makes your life even more complicated. The life was good with diode. You have only two, uh, two terminals, only one, uh, only one current and only one voltage. But now we have uh, so many voltages, so many current to deal with, right? Okay, we will discuss what is what is this transistor all about. Uh, in fact, uh, long back, uh, hopefully almost 50 years back, or more than that, 60 or 70 years back, do you have any idea when this transistor was invented? Who has invented this transistor? This bipolar junction transistor? Who has invented? Any idea? You have studied. In your first semester course, basic electrons. Oh, hopefully, before that, in your class 11 12, have you studied transistor? No. I have studied transistor. No. Huh? Not in much detail. Not in much detail. What it was invented? Any idea? Huh? Yes, 20th century, fine. Previous century. Any idea? 60, 1960. Huh? 60. Any other answer? 1950. 
let's uh, let's uh, formulate this uh, inter understanding from a different perspective let's try to observe this transistor as uh, as a combination of uh, two pn junctions something like that right so suppose you have one pn junction something like this you have n side here p side here and this is reverse biased hopefully that notion is uh, well known to you it's a reverse biased means what you have more positive voltage at the end and more negative voltage at the beta this is reverse biased properly so what happens in a reverse biased pn junction Hmm? The diode is off. The resistance diode is off. Okay, there is crack. Essentially, no current. And the if I so this is the basically the uh, that is the boundary line between N and P. That is the boundary line. And they are in both side of this boundary line. What you have? You have a depletion region. Depletion region. And if you increase this uh, this particular voltage, suppose this voltage is not constant. Suppose if you increase this voltage. Uh, some few volts to say five volts to seven volts, something like that. If you increase this voltage, then what happens? Obviously, you have to ensure that that voltage should be within this uh, PIP of that particular thing. Anyway, but if you just increase this value uh, from say two volt to two point one volt, two point one volt to two point two volt, something like that, the width of this depletion region will increase. That happens in the uh, reverse bias pn junction, reverse bias pn junction diode, and uh, there will be some current flow. Insignificant in the order of second to the minus nine, second to the minus eleven in that order. From where this current is coming, because you have some magnetic field, so there you have the positive polarity over there. So you can expect that okay, fine. The inside what you have in the inside you have the majority electrons, right? The P side you have majority holes, okay. But here in the inside you can have few holes. The P have few electrons, and because of them. You can have a very insignificant amount of current which can flow through this, which is called a reverse current, right? I'm almost uh, just ignore that particular thing. Forget about that. If essentially, what happens if we just apply reverse bias voltage over there, the, or if you increase this reverse bias voltage, the width of this depletion region will increase. Why it is called depletion? Why is it called depletion region? It is depleted of mobile charge. It is depleted of mobile charge. It's depleted of mobile charge. So you know, uh, in the inside, so how can how can you form an n-type uh, semiconductor? N-type semiconductor by doping using phosphorus. Yes. Phosphorus. Fifteen. Right. 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 So here the Doping concentration, the donor ions are present, yes. right? Yes. Plus, ND plus, and here you have the acceptor ions present, Na minus. Okay? So remember, those ions, they are immobile. Those ions are immobile and they cannot contribute to the current flow. They are immobile. The current flow is because of the presence of your mobile filters, like electrons and holes, not due to the ions. So as you go on increasing this reverse bias voltage, so what happens? You have in, in the inside you have ND plus, right? And the P side you have Na minus. And eventually, what happens? The width of the depletion region will be in this side. You have more number of this uh, ND plus ions, and this side you have more number of Na minus ions. And the width of this will also increase. For the timing, let us assume that the doping concentration of this and the doping concentration of this there. Almost the same. That means suppose it is 10 to the power 15 or 10 to the power 17 atoms per cc. Here also 10 to the power 15 or 10 to the 17 atoms per cc. Something like that. That means they are moderately put. Okay. And there is one notion which is called the heavily doping. Heavily doping means what? We, we designate this heavily doping by N plus or P plus. When I call it N plus, so typically when I call it N, so N means so moderately doped. Moderate doping. Moderate doping means whenever I call it moderate doping, that means 10 to the power say 15 atoms per cc. And if I call highly doped or heavily doped or highly doping, that means say 10 to the power say, let it be say 10 to the power 18. Okay, that means. 10 to the 3 times more. So let us assume that uh, both of them are having almost 
equal doping. In that case, the distribution of this weight, they are uniform, they are equal almost. If not, then there will be uneven distribution, asymmetric distribution. Okay, so forget about that asymmetricity for the time being. Now suppose by some means, now you understand what is what is happening in the reverse by spin junction, right? Now suppose by some means I inject some electrons in this particular region. And remember the depression region you have the presence of electric field, right? The electric field is present and that is the direction of the electric field, right? Now suppose by some means magically I inject some electrons. I don't know from where this electron is coming, but suppose I inject some electrons from outside. Outside, I, from outside, I inject some electrons into this depletion region. And since you have the presence of electric field, so because of the electric, this whenever you, you inject some electrons, they are the charge carriers, mobile charge carriers. They are not immobile. So obviously, and since electric field is present, so because of the presence of this electric field, this ultimately these electrons will be absorbed. And there will be, you can expect if the electrons are absorbed in this way, so there will be a positive current flow in that direction. Yes, I am coming from where this electron is there. Is that concept clear? Suppose I inject some electrons from outside. So, because of the presence of the electric field, because of the presence of the electric field, you can expect that these electrons will be collected over there, actually, and there is a current flow. From here to here. Remember, it's a reverse bias in them. It's not a forward bias. But still, there is a presence of current flow because of the and from outside. That is one concept that you have to, that you have to remember for understanding the operation of transistor. Okay. Fine. So now let's move to the another suppose uh, so far we have assumed that these two junctions i mean uh, these two these two regions these uh, n regions and they are symmetric. symmetric in the in the sense of doping in terms of doping they are symmetric that means if i consider that okay this n side is also having 10 to the atoms uh, 10 to the power 50 p side also having 10 to the 50 atoms per second so the doping concentration in both side was same as of now now suppose, let's consider uh, we have some uh, forward bias PN junction with asymmetric CT in doping. Forward bias means what? Here you have N side, here you have P side and P side is positive terminal of the battery and N side is connected to the negative terminal of the battery. It's a forward bias PN junction, right? But here, this is not, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the, in terms of the doping, this is not symmetric. N side is having more uh, ions about there, right? That's why it is n plus. So suppose 10 to the power 19 atoms per cc here, it was 16 atoms per cc here. So there is order difference. 10 to the power 19 atoms here, 10 to the power 16. That means for if now it's a forward bias pin junction. Right? Since it's a forward bias, so we have more number of electrons present over there inside, and more number of holes present over there in the p side. And since it's forward biased, so what happens? These electrons will move from this side to this side, also move from this side to that side. And ultimately, the, since the holes are moving in that direction, and electrons are moving in that direction, so ultimately there is a positive current flow in this direction, forward current, from P side to N side. But the point here is that, an asymmetricity in looping, so for every, and uh, suppose this uh, order difference is 10 to the power 3, 10 to the power 16 or 10 to the power 19. In P side you have a 10 to the power 16 atoms per cc, and N side you have N plus, so 10 to the power 19 atoms per cc. So therefore, for every thousand electrons crossing this junction, you have one hole crossing that junction. Right. So for every thousand electrons, if you observe the electrons moving from N side to N plus side to the P side, for every thousand electrons crossing from here to here, from left to right, n plus to p, only one holes moving from p to n plus. So, asymmetricity in looping in the forward bias p n Here, so these two concepts you have to understand. 
uh, these two concepts you have to apply in order to understand the operation of a transistor. So what is here we have one pn junction which is reverse bias, one pn junction and in the reverse bias pn junction I am injecting some electrons from outside and I find some current flowing is there and in the forward bias pn junction what I find the doping levels are not the same asymmetric in the doping level. Now let's invoke both of these two concepts and let's design or let's fabricate a new type of device. You have n plate, n plate, p and another side. So let's let's connect connect them together. So what I find, suppose I'm having a structure like this. You have one n p and one n plus p n plus. So that particular thing, this n p or operation of this particular junction, it's a bipolar junction. So basically there are two junctions. Three layers and two junctions. So you understood the notion of this uh, forward bias, asymmetricity looping, forward bias pin junction, and the reverse bias pin junction with the carrier injection. Right. So here, this NP, this particular thing, this pin junction is basically reverse bias, and this N plus P is forward bias. Since N plus P, so that means the asymmetricity looping is already implemented there. Right. But whenever you uh, you design that particular circuit or you, whenever you design that particular device, the thing is that uh, there are certain restrictions. What is one of the restrictions? The restriction is that this uh, this side, this side, this obviously as, as you can understand since it's n plus, that means it is heavily doped. So these two pin junctions, they are one n p. So these two pin junctions, they are not ordinary pin junctions. They are not ordinary pin junctions. One pin junction is uh, heavily doped, I mean this n, n side is heavily doped, n plus p, right? And this p region, this p region, the corresponding thickness of this p region is very, very small. That we have to ensure. Why? I am coming to that. It is not that you have simple n, p and n plus. Okay. It is not that simple n, p and n plus. The p side, the in between, this p side, this p, the thickness of this P, I mean if I consider that is my thickness, that is my thickness, that thickness should be very small with respect to the area. If I consider the cross-sectional area with respect to this area, this thickness should be very, very small. Why? I am coming to that. It has to be small. But why? Why, why this requirement is imposed over there? I am coming to that. Okay. So now, let's give them name. Let's give them name. So you have uh, three uh, terminals over there. One N terminal, one P terminal, another N plus terminal. Right. Let's call this terminal as the emitter terminal. Let's call this terminal as the emitter terminal. This one as the emitter terminal. This as the base terminal and this as the collector terminal. Let's call them. So that I can analyze them in a much better way. And at the same time, I'd also represent this, uh, this particular uh, structure by means of a symbol. Right. So it's a three-dominant device, so let's have this symbol. This symbol along with this three naming. So whenever you have this kind of symbol, it stands for a transistor. You have one pin junction there, another pin junction there. This is called the base terminal. The terminal with arrow is called the emitter terminal and the terminal without arrow is known as the collector. Two pin junctions over there, one pin junction there, another pin junction there. Now, as I have already mentioned that Junction between base to emitter, this junction has to be forward bias, and this junction between current, it is reverse bias. Now that particular biasing arrangement has to be maintained so that you can have something fruitful from this device. You can extract something useful from the device. 
at least for our application. You have different kind of combination, right? You have basically two pn junctions, one between the base two meter, second one between the base two collector. Since you have two pn junctions, and each of them can be either forward pass or reverse pass, so you can have four combinations altogether. Base emitter junction forward pass, base captain answer reverse pass. Base emitter junction forward pass, base captain answer forward pass. Base emitter junction reverse pass, base captain answer reverse pass. And base emitter junction has base captain answer forward pass. So you have all four combinations. But out of these four combinations, only one combination is useful for our application. You can also use the transistor in other regions as well. But whenever you forward pass the base emitter junction, and when you reverse pass the base captain junction, then the cooler region operation is known as the forward active region. And in the forward active region, this transistor will exhibit something very special. That is useful for our application. Okay. You can also have the forward passing, I mean, you can also forward pass both these two junctions. Or you can also have the, you can also reverse pass both of these two junctions. Then also transistor will behave in some different way. Okay. So these are the biasing arrangements. Question is that, as you have already observed, here you have one PN junction, you have another PN junction, right? So you may think that since it's basically a combination of two PN junction, can I simply have instead of having a transistor, can I simply have a have a diode of a rather connecting back to back, something like that? You have N plus P there. Emitter base and P base collector. So one diode over there, cathode side, anode side here, cathode side there, and another diode, anode side here, cathode side there. That means the anodes are connected together, back to back. So the question is that whether this operation of this transistor can be simply replaced by connecting two diodes back to back, whose uh, anodes are tied together. Does it make any sense? N plus P, I mean, what about there? N plus P, and another type about there, PN. Right? Does it make any sense? So, can, can I, instead of having a transistor, instead of buying a transistor from market, so can I simple, simply uh, like uh, bring some wires? More quantity, and uh, we can have the same operation as uh, exhibited by the transistor. So, whether the combination of two diodes back to back connected in, in that particular fashion, whether it can be used as a transistor or not. Or have to understand how does this particular device operate under this base emitter junction forward pass and base captain and reverse pass under this particular condition. So first of all, you have to understand how does this particular device behave. Okay, because already you know what how does a trans, how does a diode behave. Okay. Now, since the base emitter junction is forward pass, since the base emitter junction is forward pass, what do you expect? What do you expect? And remember, it's an N plus P. It's N plus P junction. That means, and if I assume that uh, there is a three order difference, say N plus means 10 to the power 19 atoms per cc and P means 10 to the power 16 atoms per cc. Difference, it's a PN junction which is forward pass. Now, since it is forward pass, Connect on battery between these two terminal. Between these two terminal, I have to connect a battery so that this junction is forward biased. Okay. Now, what, what do we expect from the device itself? Yes. What do we expect? What is the outcome? Basically, it's a pin junction diode. No. It's a pin junction. 
Uh, with acetate acid and dopamine. Uh, right? Yeah. So we expect that, okay, since the pain junction diode, so electrons will move from, so basically what we have, some voltage you are applying, suppose P1 voltage you are applying. Okay? What do you expect? You expect that, okay, the electrons will cross this junction from here to here. And for every thousand electrons crossing this junction, you have one hose crossing in that way. From N side to, from P side to N plus. From P side to N plus, you have flow of holes. And from N plus to P, you have the flow of electrons. Simple pain junction diode. Right? Now, what are those electrons which are crossing this junction? This, this is called basimeter junction. This is a basimeter junction. Now, what happens to those electrons? You have plenty of electrons crossing this junction with respect to the holes. If I have one hole, against this, you have 1000 electrons crossing the junction. Now, what happens to those electrons? They are crossing the junction. Will they be connect, Will they be ultimately collected by the battery? Or something different is going to happen there? Now, to understand this, remember that this particular region, the thickness of this particular region is very, very small. And here you have another pain junction, and this junction is reverse -based. That means what? The electrons will diffuse in the... Uh, Since it is reverse pass, so the width of the depletion region, you understand, or you, or hopefully you know, that for a forward pass pin junction, if the, suppose you have a pin junction, you have only created one pin junction, it is not biased, zero biased. So you have certain width of the depletion region because of the change in the carrier concentration, so you have certain width of the depletion Now, as you provide some forward bias, what happens yes. to the depletion region width? Decrease. It will decrease. And if you provide some reverse bias, increase. the weight will increase. Right? Now here, here I have provided uh, here I am providing some forward bias over there and some reverse bias over there. And it is that the width of this particular region is very, very small with respect to the cross-sectional area. So since you <coughs> provide a forward bias between this basimeter junction. You expect that the electrons will cross this junction and holes will cross this junction from P side to N plus side and electrons will cross this junction from N plus side to P side. Now my concern is what happening to these electrons. There are plenty of electrons crossing the junctions. What happens to them? Remember, since the width of the depletion region, or rather, since the width of this base region is very, very small, since the width of this, uh, of this is very, very small, the thickness is very small, and here you have uh, a reverse bias pin junction, so you can expect whenever the electrons are crossing the junction, and you have more number of electrons, it's sure that some of the electrons will be collected by V1, by this battery. And you have plenty of electrons crossing the junction. And there the space is very narrow. Right. Space is already very narrow. This thickness is very small. And moreover, it is uh, already a depression region. Depression region resulting from the upper P junction, which is reverse first. So now try to remember <coughs> what we have discussed in our past observation. A reverse gas P junction. And I'm in electrons from outside. There is a presence of electric field, and because of that, the electrons will be swept out. And they will be collected by the by this particular. So obviously, you have another battery over there, right? And then those electrons will be collected. And then now you can justify the names of each of these three different terminals. Mr. Y and base. Yes, I am coming to that. 
So emitter will understand why it is called emitter. It emits the electrons. It emits the start series. And n plus, that means heavily doped. You can you can you can uh, visualize it is basically acting like a source of charge carriers. Plenty of charge carriers are sent to them. That's why it is, it is known as the emitter. And ultimately, most of those electrons, almost say 80, 90, 95 to 98 percent of those electrons, they are ultimately received or at this point. This is the source, source of the charge carrier, <laughs> and this is the destination ultimately. Or, so the electrons are over there. So people are given the name collector, right? Now apart from this emitter and collector, there is a third terminal, right? This third terminal is known as a base because ultimately it determines the efficiency of that particular device. If you increase the width of the base, what happens? If you increase the width of the base, Suppose you have thousands electrons crossing this junction. Right, thousand electrons crossing this junction. And you have few holes crossing this junction. Now, you understand that, okay, the holes will be recombined. Through this, holes are moving from P side to N plus, N plus side. So some of the hole, because the electrons are moving in this direction, Electrons are moving in this direction and have holes are moving in that direction. So during this journey, the holes some holes might be recombined with electrons and rest of them will be collected by this battery. And then ultimately because of this recombination and because of this collection, ultimately it leads to a current. Because it's a flow of charge carrier. And that current is known as the base current. That current is known as the base current. Now, the magnitude of this current is very much dependent upon which parameters. This magnitude of this current is very much dependent upon the width of the base. Right. If the width is very small, I mean, if this particular, this distance, if this distance is very, very small, you expect that few electrons will be recombined with these holes and few electrons will be collected by this battery. Most of them will be collected over there. On the other hand, if you make this particular width very large, then you have more recombination. More collection of the battery if you want, not by that, but not by that particular battery over there. What is your object? You are you are injecting some electrons from this end, and your objective is to accept or is to accept those electrons over there. Only few of them will be traveling through this path. So the operation of the device is ultimately controlled by the third terminal. So basically what you understand is basically it's a flow of electrons from this side to this side, from N plus to another N, from emitter to collector, it's a flow of electrons, right? So you may argue that, okay, some source of flow of charge carrier that can be accomplished by simple way, by simple way. Isn't it? From this end, you are just emitting so many electrons from this end. So many electrons are emitted from this end. And those electrons are ultimately collected over there. And you know that, okay, some of the electrons will be lost during this journey. From here to here, some of the electrons will be lost through this path. So isn't it a better option to have a simple wear between this N and this N plus? Simple wear. Then all the electrons will be ultimately collected. There is no escape route.
There are third, no, third terminals through which the electrons can, can escape, but there is no other escape route. Is it not a good question? What do you feel? It can act only in a simple way. You are emitting electrons from one end and you are collecting electrons from the other end. Current first connection is if you have objective and that is the wire to leave by the Yes. So what is our objective? Our objective is not to pass the charge carriers, rather to control the flow of the charge carriers. Right. Also, after some time, the charge on the both sides will be saturated if you connect with the wire. So our objective is our objective is not to uh, allow the uh, the flow of charge carriers from one end to the other end, rather to control it to some extent. Okay. So if you have a third terminal, ultimately controls the entire operation. Right. So this particular terminal is responsible to find out the efficiency of this device. That's why it is it is known as a base base terminal. Depending upon the width, depending upon the carrier concentration over there, remember here also it's a basically p p type semiconductor. Now base is p type here. Yeah, you have uh, some poles as a majority carriers. So whenever the electrons are crossing this junction, so electrons are recombined by those holes. So the current ultimately, this current is also a function of this uh, sloping concentration over there, the p side, as well as the width of the base region, the thickness of the base region. That thickness. So ultimately, it controls everything. That means you have a kind of controlled flow of charge still. Might be electrons, might be holes. This is known as a NPN kind of transistor. You can also reverse this, which is called a PNP kind of transistor. Right, so the flow of charge carriers, let it be hole or electrons, so the flow of charge carriers ultimately controlled by the third term. Okay, so that you cannot accomplish by simply having two diodes connected back to that. Okay, so now what I have, okay, that thing has been explained over there. Now what I have, you have this particular symbol for a collector base emitter and you know that for, you know, to ensure the transistor to operate in the forward active region, this base emitter jumps forward bias, so since it's an NPN, so that's why this P terminal should be having more potential as compared to this E terminal or N terminal over there. That means this is having more potential with respect to the emitter. So this is accomplished by connecting a battery in this particular fashion. Okay. What else? You have to provide a corresponding reverse bias between the collector and the base. Now typically what you do, we don't connect any battery between collector to base, rather we connect on battery between collector and emitter. And you might be knowing that these three voltages, that means this C, VCB, VBE and VCE, these three voltages are related. How are they related? This VCB is nothing but VCE minus VBE. Collector to emitter voltage is equal to the collector to base voltage plus base to emitter voltage. Or in other words, your collector to base voltage is nothing but collector to emitter voltage minus base to emitter voltage VC minus VB. Now you know that in the forward active region, the it's basically NPN now. N P N. So that's why 
you know, to ensure that this junction is reversed, so this voltage should be higher than this voltage. That means Vc must be greater than Vb or Vcb should be greater than 0. Now, what is your Vcb? Vcb is Vce minus Vb. So, Vcb greater than 0 means Vc should be greater than Vb. Sir, Vcb greater than 0 it's an infinite transistor. This is the reverse bias pin junction. NPN, so this side is N, this side is P. So your N is collector, P is base. So this junction has to be reverse bias. That means this voltage should be greater than this voltage. This P, right? So VCB should be greater than 0. So it implies that VC must be greater than VB. As is VCE going to be What is VCE? VCE minus VB? What is VCE? VCE minus VB? Isn't it? Collected to base voltage is what? Collected to emitter voltage minus collected to uh, minus base to emitter voltage. VCB is what? VCB. VCB, that means the voltage difference between the collector potential, collector terminal minus the base terminal. What is your VB? This is basically VB minus VE. And what is your VC? Minus V. Right. So they are really but you don't have three independent voltages over there. You have two independent voltages. One is VB and second one is VC. What is base of voltage? Second one is the collector base voltage. Once you know these two voltages, then you can easily calculate the third voltage that is VC. Right. And you have three currents over there. Okay. So that we have already discussed the operation of uh, this transistor over there. Now What about the carrier density? Once again, now let's let's visualize uh, this means I mean this uh, N N P N transistor from a different perspective. Let's visualize in that particular fashion. Let's draw it upside down like this. This is the emitter region. You have so many electrons crossing this junction. It's a forward bias emitter base emitter junction, and there you have a reverse biased P N junction. So whenever the electrons are moving, crossing this junction, this P and this base emitter junction, at this particular point, you have high carrier density, right? And as they are moving through this base region, here the carrier density will be less. Okay. And ultimately, you, you understand that uh, uh, these electrons, most of the electrons will be uh, whenever it is in, in the vicinity of this uh, electric field, they will be collected by the by this voltage. You have another voltage connected over there between collector to emitter, right? With collector side more positive with respect to the emitter side because it's an NPN transistor. Already we have mentioned this one, something like that. This VC must be greater than VB. VC must be greater than VB. That means at the collector side, you also have at the collector side, you also have it's an N, P, N. So electrons are moving from here to here or you can also call it like N, P, N plus, something like that. Okay. So electrons are moving from here to here and then you have a plus sign over there, VC. So then these electrons are collected by this voltage, VCE. And that is sufficiently large so that they will be collected. Okay, so what is the source of the electrons? What about the source of the electrons? Source of, source of the electrons. What? Yeah, from the emitter. The emitter. From the emitter side, you have those electrons, right? Mm -hmm. So this is basically. So this is basically. A function of base emitter voltage, yeah. and this this is a forward bias pn junction. Yeah, it's a forward bias pn junction. Okay, so, so it must follow the Rad equation. Yes. It must follow the Rad equation. So I can write this to be e to the power 
some constant, this current, this current, collector current, ultimate energy which is collected, this current, some constant multiplied with e to the power v by p t minus 1. Now, what about that constant? On which parameter does this constant depend on? V t is constant. No, that is fine. E to the power v by v t minus 1. So, that is, that is showing the diode equation. E to the power v by v t minus 1. That is following the diode equation. Okay? Then, we have another thing which is, which is known as IES. I S, right? Now my question is that on which parameters, based on our today's discussion, can you tell me what are those parameters on which this I S depend on? What are those parameters and how? Weight of the base. So one is so I S depends upon is proportional to is proportional to what is proportional to inverse the cross sectional area first of all the cross sectional area depends on the cross sectional area if you have more cross sectional area you have more current right so it is directly proportional to this cross sectional area a that means if you have uh, like uh, this is a junction, so I have observed it on a two-dimensional board. So the cross-section area, if you observe from that side, that cross-section area A and IS is proportional to this A. What are the other parameters? IS is inversely proportional to width of the base. Right? And IS is also concentration the base region, the so NB, right? Inverse proportional. So if you have more, uh, I mean, if the corresponding carrier concentration is high, then you have less collector because you have more recombination, right? Okay. So now the question is given this particular equation, I C is equal to I S to the power V by V T minus one. How does I C vary with how does it vary? It's quite obvious that I C is equal to I S to the power V by V T minus one. So it varies exponentially. Right? And remember. Whenever I have drawn this, or whenever this particular graph is drawn, here for a transistor operation, you have two different voltages. One is the base emitter voltage, second one is the collector emitter voltage. For collector emitter, I, I can uh, recognize this as a collector emitter voltage. So, the variation of IC can be shown with respect to VB when the other voltage is, is constant. And suppose that other voltage is your GCE voltage. Correct. Now, what happens to the to the to the transistor itself? What happens to those charge carriers? When you have higher value of VBE, that means what? Higher value of VBE. You have power bus and suppose you are increasing this pin, I mean you are increasing the bias, you have more currents. Right? So, if you have high value of VB, you have more IC. Even if your VC is fixed, your VC is fixed, suppose. This collector voltage is fixed, but if you have high VB, you have high collector. Okay? Then the next part is you must uh, be knowing that IC is a function of VCE also. VCE. All that is not apparent from this expression. IC but suppose so here we have drawn IC as a function of VBE. 
Here we have shown IC as a function of EB and it will increase exponentially, something like that, right? Something like this. IC is equal to IS, it will be equal to DB by PT minus 1. Typically, this, uh, this uh, IS value is typically very small in the range of 10 to the power, say, uh, for example, minus 11 or something like that, minus 10, minus 11. While the corresponding character kind is in the range of say, million, 10 to the minus 3. So, 10 to the power 6 or 10 to the 7 are differences present. So, therefore, we can typically, we can have, uh, typically we can write IC and we approximately written as IS e to the power VB by VT. Because typical value for this IC, this is in, say it is in milliampere and uh, this is say little bit in nanoampere. So, 10 to the power 6 order sort of difference. So, e to the power V by Vt is much much larger with respect to 1, so I can simply neglect this minus 1 down. Okay. Now, suppose this base emitter, so you know that uh, this value is something like that. Typically, IC is equal to IS e to the power Vv by Vt. And if I increase this base emitter voltage by say 60 millivolt, 60 millivolt. Yes, what happens to the current? Do you have a calculator with you? Suppose initially this VB voltage, suppose this VB is equal to, say let it be, so this VB plus 60 millivolt. Suppose initially it was like say 700 millivolt and I have increased this to 760 millivolt. What happens to the collector current? What happens to the collector current? One answer. Yes. It will increase. 10 to the 26. 10 to the 26. I see. 2 the power VB per day. 2 the power VB per day. Not to the power 60 millivolt. No, not to the power 60 millivolt. No, it will increase. It will increase by to the power 60. And what is Vt? 25 millivolt. 2.4. 65. What is that? 625. 2. Point something. 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 625 is how much? 2 point something? Yes. So close to 10. Close to 10. That means whenever I increase this base of voltage by 60 millivolt, the corresponding current increases by 10 times. One or more. Right. So suppose it is told in your question, suppose when the is equal to say 700 millivolt, the collector current equal to say here, here. Calculate the collector current when the corresponding base of voltage is 760 millivolt. Roughly, it will increase by an order of 10. By, uh, by uh, a value of 10. Right? One order of change. 1 milliampere to 10 milliampere. If it is 10, then 10 to 100 milliampere. One order change. Okay? So that's good. So, the next question is that, uh, so although uh, here we can, we can't have any uh, dependence of uh, IC on VC, but what do we expect whenever keeping VB constant, if I change IC, what do we expect? My question is, suppose you don't know this equation, you don't have an idea of the equation, only you know the device physics, right? And suppose I am increasing the, I am keeping the VB constant, base meter voltage constant, and 
are increasing the collective meter voltage. What happens to the collective current? Current meter voltage. Current meter voltage. Uh, increasing that means uh, this, this one is constant. This uh, VBE is constant, suppose. This is constant. And I am increasing the collective meter voltage. Then what happens to the collector current? Suppose you do not have any idea about the equation. Even this equation is not perfect. Based on the discussion that we have uh, uh, made today, so you just tell me. What, what about the first observation? observation? What about the second order observation? What about the first order observation? VCE increases, fine, but VB is constant. That means the number of electrons which are crossing this basimeter junction. So the number of electrons which are crossing this basimeter junction that is eventually dependent upon the VB value. The Voltage and that forward voltage is remaining constant. Some say 700 millivolt. It's constant. That means the number of electrons crossing this basimeter junction is constant. And the other currents are also constant, like the base uh, thickness and uh, like uh, the base, I mean the area concentration in the base region, that, that's also constant. That means the recombination part is constant. You have I you have a fixed VB. That means fixed number of electrons are crossing. But here you have a very high value of uh, this electric field at the collector end. What happens to the current? As a fast product observation. It's a constant current. It's a constant current. Forget my idea. So that's why I have told you. Forget about everything. Forget about everything. It's a fast current. So based upon uh, our today's discussion, the current will remain constant. And this can also be visualized from the expression itself. This expression doesn't involve any term, which is a function of this. Even if you do not have, the, even if you do not know this expression, but still. Uh, uh, based on the uh, device physics, the operation of the device, you understand that this since this IC is not a function of VCE, so eventually this is constant as a fast order observation. Right. Okay. So eventually, this VCE doesn't have any impact on IC as long as your VB is constant. Okay. So now try to visualize. Now we are coming to the most important part about this transistor itself. As a fast order approximate, what I find, V doesn't have any say on the collector current as long as your V B is constant. So already you know that I am having. Uh, like this, I am having this uh, NPN transistor, right? NPN transistor, this is the, let me write, this is your N side, this is P side, this is N side. Emitter, base, collector. And this base emitter junction is followed by the PN, so P side is having more positive voltage with respect to the N side, right? And then, so this is not connected actually, this should not be connected here. Anyway, this is not connected, remember, this should not be connected. This is not connected, also. right? You need to look something like that. Yeah. 
you have some voltage VBE. And that voltage is VCE. And now let us put a box, something like that. And this current is IC. Okay. Now my VB voltage is constant. I am changing this. But your collector current is remaining almost constant as a first order approximation. So now let us visualize this entire thing. Okay. I am having a 3 terminal device. Fine. 3 terminal device. But this base voltage one voltage is, I mean, this base parameter junction is forward bias properly. So I don't have any external control over there. For the time being, I the control. I am allowing the control not to be there. Right? So I am having only two terminals with me. This collector end, this emitter end. Base emitter junction is already forward bias with some voltage. I am having this collector emitter voltage VCE which reverse biases this, uh, this uh, PN junction, collector is PN junction. And that this collector current is no longer a function of VCE. As long as this voltage is constant, this VB is constant, this current is also fixed. Even if I change the voltage, even if I change this external voltage. Does it bring any bell in your mind? I am changing, I am having only two terminals available to me. Uh, voltage between these two terminals and uh, current is remaining constant and is not changing. Current is not changing, it is remaining constant. What is the behavior? Can you relate? Huh? It's an ideal current source. It's an ideal current source. And that makes transistor so special. Gradually, you will see that if I can uh, operate in such a way so that it can be used as an ideal current source to some extent, then we can let, we can exploit this feature of the transistor so that it can be used as an amplifier. So, the base emitter junction is forward bias, and collector emitter junction or the collector base junction is reverse bias. Then I find the transistor operation is nothing but that of a ideal current. Ideal current. And when I exploit this behavior of the transistor in a subsequent discussion, then you will see that this gives rise to the notion of amplification. What I find? This current, this current IC, this current IC is basically it's a function of VB, it's not a function of VC. And gradually you will see that this IC can be regarded as a, or this current, collector current can be regarded as a voltage dependent current. What is that voltage? That voltage is nothing but the base emitter voltage. If I modulate the base emitter voltage, the corresponding collector current will also be changed. And now if I allow the collector current to flow through some resistance, then ultimately it will give rise to some output voltage from there. Enhanced output voltage. So eventually, this gives rise to an ideal current source. Okay. So BJT can be used as a current source, in the right? Obviously, it's a voltage-dependent current source. As I've already mentioned, if I have three different voltages, for example, VB1, 
PV2, PV3 with PV1 is less than PV2 and PV2 is less than PV3. Different currents, IC1, IC2 and IC3 and IC3 will be higher than IC2 and IC3 will be higher than IC1. And we will be exploiting that particular feature later on so that the transistor can be used as an amplifier. Remember for this, I have to bias the transistor properly. I have to bias the visibility junction in the forward, forward uh, region and the collector phase junction should be reverse phase. And this is known as a forward active region. And in the forward active region only, the transistor is or can be employed as a current source. And then we can exploit this feature of the transistor to use it as, a, as an amplifier. So almost everything is fine, but uh, still we are in the search of uh, the different terminal currents. Already we have mentioned this one, IC is equal to the current. The collector current is equal to IS e to the power VP by VT minus 1, which can be approximately written like IS e to the power VP by VT, because this minus 1, I mean this 1 is almost uh, negligible. So this e to the power term. And remember, the base current, the base current is due to what? Is due to the electrons crossing the resonator uh -huh. junction, right? It's a function of several other parameters, like it's a function of your, uh, like uh, the width of your region, uh, the doping concentration over there, and typically this base current is directly proportional to the collector current. If you have more collector then you have more this kind or vice versa. And there is a uh, proportionality constant. Hopefully you know this constant is known as the beta. And we can write this IC is equal to beta times I. And which and this beta is known as the current gain and whose typical value is around 100. Okay. What does it mean? What does it mean? If I suppose your suppose let, let's uh, let's assume that beta is equal to 99, for example. So beta is equal to 99. That means what? If I have so beta is equal to 99, so if I have 100 electrons, if I have 100 electrons crossing the junction, base meter junction, out of those 100 electrons, one electron will contribute to the base current, and the rest 99 will contribute to the collector. So for every 100 electrons, if your beta is 99. That means for every one electron contributing towards this base, the rest 99 electrons will contribute towards the collector. So now if you take the base to collector, what is that? One collector to base, that is IC upon IV, that is nothing but your the beta, that is 99. And the combination of these two, which are coming from the emitter section. So your emitter current, ultimately, so ultimately, what I have, if I encircle this transistor within within this box and over there, you have three currents. IC, the collector current, IB, the base current, and I, the emitter current. And if I apply KCL over there, then your emitter current is basically the summation of the collector current and the base current. I is equal to IC plus IB, and then ultimately you can have this over there. Mm -hmm. This emitter current IB is equal to IC plus IB and IC as you know IC is equal to beta times IB then ultimately the expression for IE is nothing but beta plus 1 upon beta IS e to the power EB upon beta. Yeah, I just forget about this minus 1 term. So, the IB G term would depend on IS or the term would depend on same vectors. IB or IS. Yes, so basically it's I is of beta. Yes, that's true. So what is your IB? I is upon beta e to the power V by Vt. Almost. So IB, the base current, is I is upon beta e to the power V by Vt. So for the Given beta is constant, or a given transistor beta is constant, 99 or 100 or 150, whatever it may be. So if IS is more, you have more IB. If IS is less, you have less IB. That means if you have a wide transistor, 
with I mean uh, if, if the cross section area is more. In that case, you have more IS, more I. On the other hand, if I consider the width of the base region, if this width is small, then more. Of course, uh, the corresponding doping concentration in the suppose this is large, then I is and accordingly your I will also be small. So typically, this uh, IS is uh, very small in the range of uh, say 10 to the power minus 9, 10 to the minus 10 amperes, and whereas IB is in the range of 10 to the power minus 5, 10 to the minus 6 in the range of micro amperes, and IC, the collector current, is in the range of. Typically, this beta is in the range is in the order of say 150, 200 something like that. So if your collector current, if your base current is say for example. 5 microampere and if your beta is, uh, beta is equal to 200, then corresponding character current is equal to 1 million. Okay. So this is uh, all about the, the operation of, of the transistor, a bipolar junction transistor. Hopefully you have already studied this one in your uh, first semester course on basic electronics. But still for the uh, betterment of our discussion, our subsequent discussion, again uh, discuss this one. And based on this understanding, we will move to the use the transistor. Basically, our this course is not on the device physics. This course is entirely on the circuits itself. And henceforth, we will employ all the circuits which incorporate the transistor. Visually. So that's why I have introduced this particular class to you, so that you can have some fear about the transistor itself operation, and then we will employ the transistor in several other uh, circuits and most of them will be on the design of defined by some and before amplification we have to bias the transistor properly the biasing is very important in the next class we will discuss the different types of biasing arrangements okay so